So the title here is Decentralized Data Marketplace. There's so many, uh, so many discussions on, out there about the huge potential of this technology, but particularly about de the, the huge decentralized data mar marketplace that is out there. It's booming, it's getting bigger and bigger. Every different debate we've been having is talking about unfettered opportunity. But I think with our two guests here today, they're two who are actually CEOs and leaders in their, in their own organizations. They're creating what the future is going to be like, hopefully to safeguard some of the same issues we have with everyday data. So if you two would like to introduce yourself, you might have met me earlier because I was doing a, a talk earlier. I'm Caroline Thomas, 20 years working in, it's called FinTech now, but always innovating in banking, finance, regulated um, industries, um, and more recently setting up my own companies as to, to in, invent new technologies, but also as advisory. And for me, one of the big passions is, how do you have privacy in this, this new world? So maybe Zane, if I start with you, you can tell us who you are and what's your passion in life to begin with for? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Zane Rana. Um, so uh, I'm the founder of a project called Farmium. So what we're really trying to do is create a decentralized data economy. Um, it's a growing asset, both in value and quantity, um, and technology building more smarter applications like artificial intelligence or personalized apps uh, through that. So uh, what I'm really passionate about is really tackling the, I guess, current unethical process where you have these massive corporations becoming empires off of our information. That's contributed by all of us around in this room and outside of the room especially as well. Um, but there's no benefit besides perhaps better engagement or better usage of the applications. So that's really what we're tackling, bringing the power of information and data and the value of that back to the people, um, essentially allowing you to profit off your information as you would with any other asset. Um, but yeah, that's my probably biggest passion <laughs> of many, many. You'll probably see in the next 27 minutes. Yeah, it's, it's like un unraveling the onion here because there's more and more, isn't there? Yeah. Alistair. You Hi, I'm Alice Johnson, founder and CEO of Nuggets. Uh, Nuggets is identity and payment uh, with self-sovereign data. Uh, uh, Nuggets is all about taking back control of your data as a user. Uh, we believe personal information should be owned and controlled by the person. Uh, we believe the uh, privacy is a fundamental human right and uh, that uh, personal waste personal data is stored needs a fundamental change because it's definitely not working at the moment. You may have just seen recently uh, uh, Tesco's uh, and the club cards all breaching data and that, that demonstrates perfectly pretty much on a daily basis these days on what the problem is and uh, that's the realm that we work with in terms of data value uh, when uh, a user chooses to share a piece of their information uh, we try to minimize it at any point in terms of nuggets but if they choose to because it is their data at the end of the day we expect a value exchange in return for the user uh, to do that we also uh, uh, give uh, rewards as well to them if they do that, but also the merchants and other participants can do that as well. It's good. So there's a common theme there of we, we actually have valuable data and how, what are the vehicles or platforms that we have to either monetize it or get better value out of what we're doing. I think the, the difference between you two at the moment are the, are the different industry sectors that you started off with. Zane, you're working with healthcare. Yeah, so originally um, we started off on healthcare because health data is the most valuable data type. Forbes estimate its value to be about $200 per person. Um, but essentially the Farmium technology applies to so many different industries. So the past year and a half, we've had a massive focus on decentralized finance. So essentially creating indexes of value of uh, data and data backed stable coins and other approaches in decentralized finance, um, which I won't go into too much, but um, we're actually going into a rebranding process, which we have a lot of things that are gonna go live, including a name change actually. Um, we're really is this a live? This is going as a live feed, yeah, so yeah. You know. so I don't want to reveal too much. Um, it's good you reminded me, actually. But, but I think also you were mentioning um, earlier in, in in the in the business that you were in, you've been involved with NHS, POCs, yeah. and things. Uh, it's, it's interesting, I think, for people here to understand how that might have worked. Where does the blockchain play a part, and where does the value of medical data, if you like, play a part? I mean, right now it's a little bit difficult with. Um, when you have entities like the NHS, not 
it's necessarily for a bad way, it's better for the people because they like to keep everything highly centralized to protect the people's, um, I guess, worrying and burdening, oh, this is your information, make sure you look after it. We don't want to have control over it because it's decentralized. They try to keep things as centralized as possible and uh, I don't know if you remember, but I think in 2018 they were hacked and there was a, a ransom uh, where of the NHS and actually they asked for a ransom in Bitcoin, which is quite funny that we're mentioning that now. And um, I think there was a statistic that 19,000 people's appointments were affected. That was operations and like life-threatening things because it just went off the grid. Um, but there's so many different data types. So you can focus on financial data, social media data, etc. Um, health is something that we're really passionate about to begin with because that's our concrete plan because we can obtain users far quicker that way and it's something that every single one of us possesses. I'm, for example, I'm not a big fan of social media on my personal life, um, but some people might be a big user of it, whereas health data is no matter what, no matter who you are as a person or personality, you do have that, um, which is quite big. And you were saying that really the, the POCs were, were, were going through chemists or pharmacies? Yes, yeah, so we actually created um, a software called Blue Patient, um, which is essentially a data analytics software, um, healthcare practitioners input information. Uh, we have our proprietary artificial intelligence that um, it does a lot of the doctor's job, which means understanding the data, um, giving insights of your information, things like blood tests. Um, so processing all of that paperwork quite instantly, uh, really. And um, we launched that uh, in 20, we created it in 2018 and launched it in 2019. So we've had about nine and a half thousand users in the UK uh, using that which is quite good. Um, but I think the perception that we saw, f saw is that the UK is a little bit further behind. So I've spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia and there's just so much appreciation for data economies because it's gonna change the world. It will change technology as we know it. Things will become personalized towards us and will benefit and profit from it on a monetary level and through other means as well. Um, but I think events like this are awesome because there's so much blockchain innovation here and there's so much people who want to get in the industry, but they don't know how, but they're still in the UK. So it's great that mm. we have this like hub uh, where everyone can collate and share, I guess. That's a good one. And I think it's also a good time for Alistair. Your business is looking after payments and money. So it's a different end of the value spectrum, if you like. We've heard a lot about fintech and some of the everything from Facebook to, to big banks getting in there. What are you doing that it's different in your use of blockchain and, and, and in your, your actual marketing approach? Yeah. Well, uh, at the end of the day, we started out problem first. Uh, yeah. We didn't just go, oh, blockchain, let's go and find something for it. We actually realized it, it started with myself having my own uh, uh, payment details used fraudulently online, yeah. to wait for the card to come back. And then you've suddenly realized you've got to plug it in to 20 different e-commerce sites. And then we've all had this problem when our cards get cloned at the end of the day. So we actually solved that problem. And then we were looking for solutions where we had uh, zero knowledge store with uh, transaction records, immutable, uh, zero trust principles uh, in terms of uh, the technology, and that's when we saw the blockchain uh, ticked all these. Now, at the end of the day, what we saw was we were addressing the everyday people's problems, and mm -hmm. the, the thing is, if you, uh, most of us who are online nowadays, we, we do uh, two key things. We access or log into something, and then we might pay for something, and we'll probably do that two or three times a day and it's very common to us. Now, if you log into my Amazon account and see that I blew, bought blue socks on Wednesday, I don't really care. But if you then start taking my payment details, I get quite upset. So we looked at the things that were immediate to uh, uh, the everyday people and started looking at how we could solve those problems. And that's what we're doing. We're getting an identity where it's a verified user, bringing them on board, uh, and then interacting with those services uh, with a digital identity. And then and enabling payment through that so no longer is the payment information left with the merchant even going through the merchant uh, at that it can all be resolved at, at the endpoint with the payment rails or ideally if you're using more advanced uh, future payments you can go direct to merchants as well but if part of it as well is a stepping stone from going from today where everyone has plastic in their wallets yep. uh, to tomorrow where we can just switch over to the faster payment methods, you know, DeFi and other principles like that. So yeah, very much for us, it's looking at the everyday
everyday use of people. And then normally where we interact is uh, merchants, payment gateways, and uh, banks and services for uh, them accessing. And that can be on both levels, merchant service and on the uh, consumer side and entering into bank accounts and things like that. And bringing it all together, I think, because I, I think that common area is almost the inconvenience of, of looking after your own data and whether you're just trying to go shopping or you're trying to get into your own bank account and it looks like the only people who can't remember anybody's passwords are yourselves because yeah. they've been changing all the time. I'm wondering <coughs> in the audience how many of you, I'm not asking you to, to, to um, put your hand up if you've been hacked or anything, but how many of you are more getting more concerned about how your everyday data is being exploited or used, or, or whether you have control under it. Well, I think that's a majority, Everyone. isn't it? <laughs> I think there's literally been a tipping yeah. point, and probably for uh, Facebook, unfortunately, their, mm. their point of a data breach, uh, and n numerous other ones, Marriott Hotels, uh, BA, myself, I was breached uh, through uh, having flown with BA, and the interesting thing about that, they took my credit card details and my passport details, I changed both of those, and then the uh, digital security system that they sent for me to protect me after the fact, asked for 12 pieces of personal information. So I went from having two pieces of information that I deleted to having 12 pieces of information held by them that were even more dangerous for them to have. So the problem is, it's, it's just getting, it's, it's exponential in its growth of where the problem. And what you're often seeing is businesses say, oh, we're about privacy. So there's some very big brands out there that put their stamp and say we're all about privacy. But if you realize that if you've got any legacy system beyond the last few years, how can you have that privacy model? Because you've got such a big legacy system that um, cannot uh, work to that. And it's only the modern companies that work by privacy by design from day one and are meticulous yeah. in it, that you can actually truly be a private company and that have access. I mean, in terms of us, we have no access whatsoever to the user information. And it's atomized into individually encrypted components because of that. And I think that's one of those consistent questions that come out, whether you're, <clears throat> you're looking for VCs or you're looking for clients or you're looking for different partners, is who's, who's controlling the data? Who's owning the data? And how can people trust organizations like yourselves to be custodians of... They, they believe that they own the data themselves, but how are they doing that? Well, I mean, from our point of view, we mm. work with trusted partners. The banks are seen as uh, trust, uh, uh, custodians from the past. Some people would say they don't trust the banks, uh, but you really have to do and establish, because uh, it's very difficult as a new business and a brand to say, trust me, I'm great. We've got all these, uh, we've built privacy by design. Mm. But you have to work with existing trusted brands, and uh, with us, that's normally in the payment space and in terms of that. But also new requirements come out. There's uh, requirements for age proofs and things like that that can be associated to the da data. So those new requirements cause people to go into new realms of digital identities and things like that. So it actually pushes them towards that because before that, those uh, services didn't exist. So they have to work with new technology as well. Yeah, and Zane, with your business as well, it's, um, you it's mentioned there's a marketplace essentially, isn't it? So I wouldn't really look at this as something that we've seen as an issue because um, I think decentralization kind of fixes this and fixes this anyway, yeah. um, where you have this essentially technology. You put trust in technology rather than custodians or people. So on Farmium, for example, you own your data portfolio. It grows over time in value and quantity, but we as a company can't touch that. Um, all we can do is um, anonymize you if you request to be done so according to GDPR, uh, but we don't actually have any control over it. Even actually our own um, interpretation and structuring of information. So there's so much different data types and a lot of it isn't quality data. So filtering it out and structuring it so that applications on the Farmium network can refine and uh, choose precise specific things um, for users, so age group or ethnicity or geography, whatever they require. Uh, we create our own AI to actually structure the data as much as it can be done so. So we have limited human intervention, which is awesome because then it's, you're putting trust in technology. And in events like this, that sort of has a little bit of a buzz because Bitcoin, whether you like it or don't, that's essentially what it's built on. You trust code, you trust math rather than trusting banks or people. And the same in decentralized finance, which we touched on earlier, is trusting technology rather than 
people. And mm. uh, I trust definitely technology more than people. Well, well I think the DeFi is, is one of the big trends, again, that everybody's looking out for. Of how it, It's almost people have got, got used to fintech, they've got used to digital identities and things like that, and now here's another wave. So what, looking ahead, if we're sitting here one or two years' time, how do you think that's going to be really impacting your business? Yeah. I mean, there? in terms of DeFi, and I talked on the panel yesterday and yeah. about that, um, I think the thing is the, the, the stepping stones, uh, the on-ramp into that environment, at the moment it's quite niche. I think it was recorded as having a billion uh, dollars uh, in the DeFi environment, but you're looking at three trillion yeah. in the existing uh, commercial env banking commercial environment. So it's still very quite niche, and part of that acceptance is coming in is things like verified identity, working with AML5, IDAS, and all these new requirements. And part of those new principles is like transaction proof makes for better identities than we have before. When you start to put identity and payment together, it becomes very powerful uh, in terms of that. So I think that uh, we will on-ramp uh, almost uh, uh, DeFi into the existing world where the everyday people, because we're at the point when everyday people want to get a loan instantly yeah. or credit instantly from those services, uh, they, they want it, but they may not have access to it. So when it's become accessible, that's when it will grow. Uh, and then what you'll see is the old school coming in and seeing that, hold on a minute, their loans and credits are a lot cheaper than ours, so we, we can't because our legacy system costs twice as much to run than theirs. They'll have to move towards those models yeah. as well. And I, it sounds like the, <coughs> there's, a, there's a change and an opportunity there where, um, particularly if you're trying to get credit at the moment, you, you need to turn up with this almost unattainable um, benchmark of can you turn up at, at least with your utility bill and 10 years of pay slips and everything else. In emerging markets that doesn't work and if you actually look if, of, if a bank has that much information maybe some of the platforms like the Facebooks and the Amazons have much better data insights than, yeah, most than these banks. So how do you if you look at the, uh, at the moment, you have credit reference. It's like a group of people somewhere sit in a room and say yay or nay. And then now you start to see like Alipay's like AI uh, rated credit and it's starting to work a lot quicker. Uh, what we're saying is that basically if you have a transaction record that there's no public information out there for the uh, transparent, but if you have a transparent transaction record and you can see that you're doing good payments and the merchant said it's good, the, the payment gateway said it good, the acquirer of a bank said it's good, and you record tens of thousands of those against your digital identity, isn't that 10 times stronger as a value point than uh, a driver's license and a discussion over what happened over the last three years? And then if you start to bring into play things like homomorphic encryption and alongside PSD2 and bring in all your bank statements and then without revealing your data, you you can see that I've had 10 1,000 pound transactions and they all went through, yep. uh, that people can then go, I'll give you a, a, a car loan or something like that against that principle. And so then, it becomes very powerful in what technology can do, but yet without revealing any personal information. And, and then in a sense, the blockchain can help by having that breadcrumb trail, anonymized breadcrumb yeah, trail I mean, for, your, for your credit. That's really the essence yeah. of what it is, it's that, that transaction record against that. And you can go to a new service, and when you land, instead of what happens at the moment, you land in Chicago, buy a fluffy toy, and they say, you should be in London still, I'm not having this. They can look at your digital identity and go, you're really good, you've never had a bad mark against you, I'm happy to transact with this identity. Completely, and, and I think p part of that, Zayn, you're, as you're expanding your business from farmers say into finance and you're talking possibly about a world of identity there is a world of identity opportunities there how are you going to navigate through that i mean that's so for right now that's not something we worry about too much but like if you look at for example DeFi, where this topic yep. came up from um with data really the area we're trying to focus which is something we've been developing on for about six months or so now um it's just something we're really excited about and with data it affects everyone in this room because if you look at other so i mean decentralized finance to put it simply are just censorship resistant financial models um so for example tether is a centralized well in my opinion is a centralized approach so for those of you who haven't heard of tether essentially it's fiat one-to-one -one pegging so imagine 100 people in this room 
um, one person says, I have $100 in my account and issues a thousand, uh, sorry, 100 uh, stable coins pegged for $1. We trust him, we trust his wallet, that's centralized. And a different approach is imagine if there's 100 people in this room, probably a little bit less, um, but if there's 100 people and we all contributed one US dollar um, and that was 100 US dollars of stable coins, imagine if instead of one US dollar, if it was one US dollar of data as an asset, and now that's back to 100 st stable coins. It's a far more decentralized approach and it's using data as um, an asset, mm -hmm. which is something we're looking to see. I think data will become not just the language, but the currency of technology, of the future as well. Um, it will be exchanged, it will be sought after, and it will need to be privatized. And blockchain does exactly that. So through blockchain, we can enforce in technology and code, um, user centricity, user control. There's no corporation that needs to own your data. You own it. And when applications pay to access yours and another thousand people's data, you get a share of that. It's completely decentralized. It's a model similar to decentralized cryptocurrency exchanges, if any of you have seen that where um, you can actually earn shares of and stuff like that and you get a fee, uh, the fee that's paid of the volume and stuff, you get a share of that. Um, but this is done for data. So um, there are a lot of different things going to be created from this industry. Um, decentralized finance is one that's been talked about over the past couple of months a lot. Uh, but there are so many different ones and I think the reason to get excited about it is because we're creating data at rates we've never seen before. So there's a statistic that over the past two years alone, more than 90% of the world's mm. data was created. We've got 5G now, IoT, devices, uh, IoT device usage is increasing. So we're going to see rates of data creation that we've never seen before. So what do we do with all of this? So now you have so many new models and opportunities to be created. And that's the reason to get excited about this industry right now, this particular industry, data through blockchain, data economies through blockchain technology, where people are trusted, people own their data, encoded in code, um, and they can earn shares, especially tokens as a listing feature, which is Farmium's yeah. model. And yeah, there's just And then you've got different layers like AI on top. Yes, it could be the, the intelligent brain that's helping, absolutely. helping the, sort, sort of resource the, the ledger of amazing data yeah. that's there, and 5G data, and an AI mix, and you really have some big, big changes happening really quickly. A quick note on, um, on DeFi. I believe tomorrow is part of Blockchain Week. There's a, a DeFi session an all-day workshop on that. Uh, so look on, on the website for that one. Um, there's three minutes left, so I'd like to see if there's any questions from the audience of um, whether it's DeFi, whether it's how are we managing um, your privacy and the ownership of your data in this brave new world that we're going into. We've got a roving microphone. Everyone's stunned. Do you think that... <laughs> Go to a pub then, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think the caffeine's wearing off, but... <laughs> oh, there is a question. Uh, hi, yeah. So um, there are a lot of players... So with the B2B lending, there are a lot of people using alternative data. So sort of the data points you've mentioned um, to loan to SMEs. Um, on the consumer side, there have been similar companies who have tried to use these data sources to credit score people or to analyze their data. Um, to sort of do behavioral analytics on them and uh, make loans eventually. Um, but these guys haven't been very successful. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, are they using the wrong data points? Um, are these data sets not large enough? Um, do you have any opinions on that? Um, I mean, to be honest, there's lots of different companies um who have tried creating things off data, data marketplaces, and many of them have failed. Um, it's hard to boil it down to just one reason, but I think the centralized versus decentralized argument is a massive one, how much you give trust or ownership of the end user. Um, with me, I'm a heavy advocate for decentralization is, is the future. Um, there'll be decentralized uh, currencies, there'll be decentralized internet usages, there'll be so many different ones. Um, and I think that's a massive aspect to it. If you have something that's centralized in many different industries, it'll fail. And I think in a data economy where you need to have so much trust, not having that encoded is a massive issue and it can't scale, in my opinion, to the same extent. Um, there, are other use, there are other reasons why these things have failed and one of the biggest ones I would say is liquidity of data. You need information that's contributed by so many different people all over the world and it has to be high quality data, otherwise it just, it's just useless. Um, so again, having a decentralized model where people contribute data into this uh, decentralized network, this decentralized blockchain, 
and then they get a fee every month or so whenever their data is used. Um, it's a far better model than, I guess, trying to obtain people's data without their permission or without full share of, without full benefit or they have any stake in things. Um, in my opinion, these two reasons are probably the biggest, and I think enforcing them uh, through blockchain is quite great. And also, actually, a third one I would say, one which blockchain isn't really talked about too much, that on a simple level, blockchain is just a data structure. Take all the media and hype away, that is essentially what it is. So having integrity of data, you can track uh, whenever any information has been tampered with or whenever anything's been appended to the data log, etc. Through blockchain, you can do that, and you can create immutability and trust in that. So whenever that data is transacted, you don't have to validate the information's integrity. It hasn't been tampered with, forged, or it's not fraudulent. So again, uh, blockchain enforces exactly that. So that's the reason I'm really excited about this, because previous technologies may not have been able to do that. Blockchain can, and it will as well. Alistair? Um, in our point of view, we're, we're a little bit different. Uh, we're not really uh, handling the data uh, to distribute it or uh, go against it. We're, we're enabling the individual to look after their data yeah, and take back control of it. Uh, our model in terms of commercial is uh, transaction fees. So if you do transact with someone, uh, uh, there's a transaction fee to the merchant. It's free to the user. Now, uh, in terms of a user getting any gain from that, if they do give an email for a discount at a service, they get value as well uh, from ourselves, and the merchant can also give them a value uh, in terms of that. So that's, that's how it works. So we're not so much uh, providing that information as a central data source uh, to crunch it, but there's a value return for individuals' data, and that's what we see as being very important. Our, our actual model is to keep as much as you can to yourself and minimize that and things with like uh, uh, ZKPs and homomorphic encryption will actually make that easier in future as it gets more accepted. But you, with things like homomorphic encryption, you can get a lot of data mm. information back from it, but having never revealed your information. So that's really the model that we see as it goes forward into that. And uh, alongside that, there's also a lot of behavioral data and metadata. Um, if, we've all seen uh, stories of the NSA say in the past where they've got so much data we can't use it because we can't get to it quick enough. Uh, but what they've ended up looking at is, uh, and they're a great example of how to manage large amounts of data, is they looked at the metadata around it. And that actually becomes more useful because it enables you to focus in on which data you should look at or ask for or work with thereafter. So it's a lot better way of dealing with massive amounts of data. It's a good summary. And with that, we have to go, otherwise we get thrown off, don't we? But I think one of the main messages, first of all, that there's companies like you out there providing solutions for this and for the audience, really start getting aware of how valuable you are. Your personality, your buying habits, everything is now a data marketplace. So start doing your own asset management of yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you.